everybody and welcome back to esoteric atlanta of course my name is bryce today is part one of our look at the book the woman with the alabaster jar mary magdalene and the holy grail written by margaret starbird i know that while reading this book there's probably going to be some stuff that i do absolutely disagree with but it's not going to stop me from looking at this work with you guys i hope that that's a good lesson for us going forward i know that in this time of massive upheaval we tend to take very extreme views and if somebody or something alters from our opinion in the slightest we tend to kind of brush it off but my perception on life and on education is never to throw the baby out with the bath water. Now, what do I mean by this? Many of you know that I, myself, in my opinion, I don't believe that the person that we know is Yeshua or that they call Jesus was ever crucified. I believe that this was totally made up by King James and the controllers because they were mimicking other stories of like Mithra. And they were trying to get humanity to turn more to a Luciferian faith. We do know that the God of the canonized Bible is Lucifer. Lucifer is not the God, however, of the uh, missing books of the Bible, the Gnostic books of the Bible. We know that the people who have been in control of the Bible and of Western Christianity are themselves, for the most part, Satanists. Uh, we do know that the word church means mind control. It comes from the Scottish word kirk which comes from the, the goddess Cersei, who was responsible for indoctrinating and feeding off of people. So that is why they call it a church and not a temple. And so I think I, I haven't read this book. I, as I, with, with these topics, um, I'm covering them for the first time with you guys, but I'm pretty sure we are going to see references to Jesus's crucifixion, which again is not something that I believe ever happened. Now, this opinion of mine has only come about in the last couple of years. If I had read this book 10 years ago, I would absolutely believe that he was crucified. But as we awaken and we, we learn things, um, we learn the truth about things. And I do know from my research, which we are going to cover later on around Ash Wednesday, we are going to cover the story of Tammuz and Ishtar which is where we get the crucifixion story as well, where we also get the 40 days of, of Easter. Ishtar is Easter. The 40 days of Lent is the, the, the age of Tammuz when he was killed. Um, and what, what, why this is significant is because in my research, I have found that Yeshua bin Yosef, who they called Jesus, and his wife Magdalene were Egyptian. They were not Jewish. They were Egyptian. And I know that might be something that I... We will find in this book, she might call them Jewish, uh, but no, they were Egyptian. They were um, of the priest and priesthood of Isis, which is the Essenes. Back then, they they spelled Isis, E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, which is where we get the Essenes from. And what was traditional for the priest and priesthood of Isis each year was for the high priest and priestesses to reenact the story of Tammuz and Ishtar. So what I mean by this, no, no one was sacrificing themselves or hanging on a cross they simply would act it out as a ritual in order to honor the coming of easter or the new birth of life where the men would go basically away for three days into the underworld and their women would come their wives would come and open the door to let them out which is why we see in the bible magdalene is the one that goes to the cave first she was his wife but he wasn't dead that's the thing he was never dead they were just reenacting this event every single year and so what i believed happened is the controllers took that and twisted it to get people to worship human sacrifice and so that's something that i am working on a story i'm working on just my opinion but i did want to let you guys know so i know there's going to be some stuff in this book that i do not agree with but i still think there's valuable probably going to be valuable information in here nonetheless so today we're just going to look at the pre the preface I'll put a link down in the description box below if you want to get your own copy of this book. Uh, once again, if that's something you can't afford right now, no worries. I'm going to be reading it on my channel anyway. But I always do suggest people get their own copy so that they can see it for themselves. But if again, if that's something that's not affordable for you at the moment, no big deal. All right. So this is written by the author. Again, her name is Margaret Starbird. Institutional Christianity, which has nurtured Western civilization for nearly 2,000 years, may have been built on an, a gigantic flaw in doctrine, a theology, San Andre's fault, the denial of the feminine. Okay, and well, that's another thing I'm not so sure about is our dating. I don't think it's been 2,000 years, but again, that's just my opinion. 
For years, I had a vague feeling that something was radically wrong with my world, that for too long, the feminine in our culture had been scorned and devalued. But it was not until 1985 that I encountered document, documented evidence of a devastating fracture in the Christian story. On the re recommendation of a close friend who knew of my intense interest in judo christian scriptures and the origins of christianity i read a book in april of 1985 entitled holy blood and the holy grail which was published in the united states as holy blood holy grail and i was frankly appalled i have read holy blood holy grail i read holy blood holy grail back in probably the early 2000s for those who are not sure about what that book is it was like the precursor to the da vinci code so it was the first real big evidence in our modern timeline that Yeshua and Magdalene were married. Okay, so that was like the big like oh, taboo moment of the book that they were married and they actually had children. But the funny thing is, if you read the missing books of the Bible, the missing of books of the Bible tell you they were married and had children. It's all over the missing books of the Bible. The only place where it's not documented is the 66 canonized books, which everybody on this channel knows, those books have been heavily edited over the years. So in my opinion, the 66 canonized books of the Bible are absolutely not the word of God. And they are absolutely the words of the controllers. And they've been controlled and changed, the narrative changed to keep us in bondage. So it shouldn't be that shocking that Magdalene and Yeshua were married again all the missing books of the Bible speak of them being married as if it's no big deal. All right. And it really is no big deal. So they were married. Most of you are married, right? It's no big deal. My first impression of Holy Blood, Holy Grail was that the authors, Michael Bejant and Richard Lee and Henry Lee Lincoln had to be wrong. Their book seemed to border on blasphemy. And of course that's mind control, right? That's mind control. That's cognitive dissonance. We have all this evidence that shows you that they were married, but yet the church has done such a phenomenal job of brainwashing people and programming people that when they're seeing the actual evidence in front of them, they freak out and call the truth blasphemy. Hence why I get tons and tons of death threats from Christians all the time. All I'm doing is reading through material and presenting research, it's all I'm doing. And, but it's challenging their masters. If you're going to a church every Sunday, you're being brainwashed every single Sunday. And if you haven't taken the time to figure out the mechanics of a church, then you are literally sheep to the slaughter. The reason why your pastor or your priest wears a black robe is because he or she has been sworn into the cult of Satan. Don't believe me? Look it up. Look it up. You are in a satanic system. But when someone like me shows you evidence of this, just shows you the evidence, I'm the one that gets the death threat. So I understand why she's reacting on their work being blasphemy because that's how deep mind control, if you are still in the Christian church, you are under mind control. You're under programming. You are not in control of your own thoughts. You are being controlled by someone else. All right. So I understand what what she's why she reacted that way, because most of us in the Western world were very much raised in the cult, the destructive cult of Christianity. And, you know, the word Christianity means to still the Christ. Right. I mean, people know that you've looked that up. Right. Everybody who claims to be a Christian, they tell you it means to be Christ like, but that's not true. If you're just taking what someone's telling you, even me, if you're just taking what I'm telling you without looking it up for yourself, then you're not learning. I beg of you to go and look up the true definition of the word Christian. It means to steal the Christ. At its core was the suggestion that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, was married to the other Mary found in the Gospels. She is the one called the Magdalene, the woman shown in Western art carrying the alabaster jar, the saint whom the church calls a penitent prostitute. And once again, we know from my research, or I know from my research, that her name was not Mary. It was never Mary. Her name was just Magdalene. Uh, same with Yahshua's mother. His name was Alma Mari. The controllers love to change names. We know that the name Jesus actually means Hail Satan. Yeshua was his name. Yeshua, translated into modern language, is Joshua, not Jesus. The J sound did not exist back then. That's why it was Yeshua ben Yosef. 
His mother was named Alma Mari. His wife was Magdalene. Mary was a derogatory name that the controllers gave. Basically, every single fucking woman in the Bible has the name Mary, especially in the New Testament, as a derogatory way of making them like a Jane Doe. Okay, even in the gay community today, what do gay men call each other? They call each other Marys. We have a bar in East Atlanta Village that is a gay bar. It's a really fun gay bar. It's called Marys, right? So we need to be really logical about this and understand why why are they changing all these people's names? Her name was Magdalene. His name was Yeshua. I was not merely shocked by this suggestion. I was shattered. How could the church have failed to mention this if it were true? So important an allegation could not have been overlooked for an entire 2,000 years of church history. Yet the evidence compiled by the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail suggested that the truth had been ruthlessly suppressed by the Inquisition for centuries, and it happened way long before the Inquisition. Being a faithful daughter of the Roman Catholic Church, I immediately assumed that the authors of the heretical book were mistaken. But their central thesis that Jesus had been married, Yahshua had been married, gave me no rest. It haunted me. What if it were true? What if Magdalene, the wife of Yahshua, had somehow been deleted from the story? And what if the infant church had then continued to develop without her gentle presence? And we know from the missing books of the Bible, especially if you've been on this channel for a while, if you're new to this channel, you might be super shocked by things that I'm saying. I have a whole playlist, Understanding the Magdalene, that you'll find this book in, as well as many others. Plus, there's a playlist from The Dark Outpost, which is all of our works into the missing books of the Bible. And if you look into the missing books of the Bible from the New Testament, Yeshua never left his, his, his organization, his temple, his students, to Peter. He never left it to Peter. He left it to Magdalene and his brother James, which makes sense, right? If you're a husband and you have an estate, who are you going to leave your estate to? You're going to leave it to your wife and your brother, not to Peter, especially not to a narcissistic, psychopathic asshole as Peter. But it makes sense that the the, the satanic church that inverted Jesus, or excuse me, Yahshua's teachings, they inverted them, would call upon Peter, would change it to Peter, because Peter was a lunatic. He was a complete negative entity. He was awful. I can't stand him. And in the in the missing gospels, you see how fearful Magdalene as well as some of the other disciples were of Peter. Because Peter was pure fucking evil. It wasn't Judas who was evil. It was Peter. All right. Pondering the implications of that terrible loss to the church and to humanity became unbearable for me. In tears, I prayed about this heretical version of the gospel. I knew that I had to find the truth. Armed with an academic background in comparative literature, medieval studies, linguistics, and scriptural studies, I dried my tears and set out to research the heresy, assuming that I would soon be able to refute its tenets. The book had touched on many areas of my own special interest and expertise, religion, medieval civilization, art, literature, and symbolism. I had taught Bible study and religious education for years, so I knew the terrain. In the beginning, I thought that debunking the heresy would be a simple matter. I went directly to the paintings of artists, artists implicated by the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail as having been in collusion with the Grail heresy. I examined symbols in these works, cross-referencing them with the watermarks Albigensians, who were heretics who flourished in the south of France from around AD 20 to 1250, which I had found years before in the obscure work by Harold Bailey called The Lost Language of Symbolism. I was disconcerted to discover that the works of these medieval, medieval artists contain obvious references in support of the Grail heresy. Unable to refute the heresy based on their work, I continued my quest. So, of course, the Grail heresy she's speaking about is the, uh, the truth that Magdalene and Yeshua had children. The name Magdalene means womb, 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 as in a woman's womb to carry on a bloodline. And we have studied, uh, I will pen this episode down in the description box below, the Merovingians. We have talked a lot about the Merovingians. They were the bloodline of Magdalene. That's where Merovingian comes from. It wasn't necessarily the bloodline of Yahshua. It was the bloodline of Magdalene. Magdalene's bloodline is O negative, which is what I am. I am O negative. And that was the bloodline that came straight from Atlantis because it all really does have to go back to the Atlanteans. 
My research equally drew me into deep into European history, heraldry, the rituals of Freemasonry, medieval art, symbolism, psychology, mythology, religion, and the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Everywhere I look, I found evidence of the feminine that had been lost or denied in the Judeo-Christian tradition and of the various attempts to restore the bride to her once cherished status. Yes, the church is not the bride of Yahshua. The bride of Yahshua was Magdalene. The more deeply I the more deeply involved I became with the material, the more obvious it became that there was real substance in the theory set forth in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And gradually I found my son self won over to the central tenets of the Grail heresy and the very theory I had originally set out to discredit. In amassing materials for this book, I have operated under the assumption that where there is smoke, there is fire. When so much evidence from so many diverse sources can be assembled to attest to a single hypothesis, there is good reason to take that hypothesis seriously. Thus, there could easily be some truth in the rumors that have persisted for 2,000 years, maybe not so long, surfacing most recently for all to see in the fil film versions of God's Spell, Jesus Christ Superstar and The Last Temptations of Christ, movies which depict the relationship of Yahshua and Magdalene as one of special in intimacy and significance. Of course, I cannot prove that the tenets of the Grail heresy are true, that Yahshua was married, or that Magdalene was the mother of his child, not just child, but children. They had five children. We know of Sarah, or Sahar, however, however they said it, it's not really said Sarah, who apparently has a gospel under the Vatican that no one has seen, but there were four other kids as well. So they had five of them. I cannot even prove that Magdalene was the woman with the alabaster jar who anointed Yeshua at Bethany, but I can verify that these are tenets of heresy wildly believed in the Middle Ages, That and the fossils of that heresy can be found in numerous works of art and literature, that it was vehemently attacked by the hierarchy of the established church of rome and that it sur survived in spite of relentless persecution so basically she, she's saying even though the controllers tried to persecute like crazy the truth still survived it was still understood by a small percentage of people that yeshua and magdalene had been married and did have children five children who ended up becoming the Merovingians. And of course, if we understand the Merovingians, we start to understand Tartaria, which completely puts our timeline on a different historical trajectory than the one that we've been taught. According to boards like the Cassiopeia and the Law of One, all those, those boards, there's a thousand years of our history that's been added in by the controllers, a thousand years of historical facts that never happened. And so if they added in a thousand years of historical facts that never happened, what did they take out in replace of that? They took out Tartaria, which was the a thousand years of peace. See, you guys, this is what I'm saying. Yahshua was not crucified. Yahshua was never supposed to be crucified. The God of light and love, the God of creation, doesn't demand human sacrifice. Lucifer does. Yahshua and Magdalene came to earth as the two, the two teachers, because the original Jewish prophecy said there, there would be two of them. The Christian church went back and changed the narrative. Any good narcissist, narcissist, any good psychotic narcissist will go back and rewrite history to prove their point. So what they did is they went back and rewrote history saying there would be one of them instead of two of them. There were two of them, Magdalene and Yashua. Why does there have to be two of them? Divine feminine, divine masculine. That's how balance of nature works. The yin, the yang, right? Okay, so Magdalene Yashua came to earth at the end of the fall of Atlantis. We went through the tribulation and then boom, into the thousand years of peace, which we call Tartaria. This is all in the book of Revelation, you guys. This is nothing shocking. Okay, the thousand years of peace which we now call tartaria was started by magdalene and yashua's line which were the merovingians the merovingians were called the merovingians because they were referencing to magdalene's bloodline which was the bloodline of da -da 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 -da, as i said earlier atlantis we are the descendants of atlantis right that's what the emerald tablets tell us the fall of atlantis was created by the polarized negative beings and the emerald tablets were written right after the fall magdalene and yashua come in we have this time of, of tribulation and all of a sudden we're in the thousand years of peace after the thousand years of peace are over what happens tartaria falls lucifer and his hunchman his hitchman his controllers his cabal are released back onto the earth in order to enter in what we call gog and magog which is where we are now okay so the end of the 
1700s all throughout the 1800s we're looking at a time when humanity was being rebuilt from the mud floods that took out tartaria that's why we have things like incubator babies hello child strike of 1899 i will tag that video down below in the description box if you missed that as well um and also if this is totally new to you surprise nothing you've been taught in school is true not a fucking thing we don't even know what our fucking earth looks like okay so this is why i really some of this medieval stuff dark ages stuff they're talking about that shit never happened that was tartaria where they knew and this is why this secret of yashua and magdalene having children was able to sustain all this time because for most of this time it wasn't a fucking secret they knew they had their there they're, they're, they are they're the kids the merovingians the Merovingians, there they are. They're taking in the bloodline of Atlantis into Tartaria, which now bleeds over into Gog and Magog. All right? We're in a spiritual war. We're in an information war. I fear most people who are awake now, who are aware of what's going on, they know that the government has lied to them. They know that the educational system has lied to them. They know medicine has lied to them. They know science has lied to them. But they still cannot accept the fact that their church has lied to them. Honey, bless your heart. As we say in the South, that's a way of calling people dumbasses in the South. Bless your heart. The church is at the tippy top of this problem. It is so much easier to manipulate someone when you've got them scared of their own mortality. Don't be afraid of your own mortality because you don't die. That's the biggest lie. The church is your enemy. And in fact, I really would like to sit down with, and if, the, if, if you're watching, I'm not going to say your name. I went to high school with a guy who is now the preacher at the church I grew up in. He did my grandmama's funeral a couple of years ago, and I wanted to punch him in the gut. I wanted to kick him in the balls. I was so pissed off at that funeral. He was the most disrespectful ceremony I've ever been in in my whole entire life, and my grandmother deserved more respect than that. It was a plug for the church to get more money. Well, if you're watching this, I'm not going to say your name. My grandmother believed in reincarnation. You didn't know that, did you? You don't care. You, you, my grandparents were wealthy. They were filthy rich. And what you wanted to make sure of was that your little cult, your destructive fucking cult, got that money. And I want to ask you, preacher at the First Presbyterian Church in Rome, Georgia, why do you lie to your parishioners? T why don't you tell them why you wear a black robe? Who's your real God? Who do you really worship? Because you and I do not do not worship the same God. I know that for sure. The preachers in church and myself, we don't worship the same God. I don't worship Lucifer. And this is what makes me so fucking mad. So I, I just hope and pray. I hope and pray that people start to wake up. The church is not your friend. It is not your friend. The heresy that, ke that kept alive the other versions of the life of Yahshua's was ruthlessly hunted down, tried, and sentenced to extinction. But the story of the sacred bridegroom king of Israel proved too too virulent for the, even the Inquisition and not the king of Israel. That's another lie. Jacob, who was Israel with his 12 tribes, those are the families of the cabal. The true children of Israel, the missing tribes, are the galactic tribes. Be careful who you're venerating. Jacob, Israel, was not a good guy. Neither was Abraham. I mean, if we go down the bloodline to Solomon that the church venerates, in the Testament of Solomon, a missing book of the Bible, and we know why it's missing, because Solomon tells you the truth, he worshiped Moloch. Yahweh is Moloch. They're sacrificing babies. Why are you venerating a person who did that? He had 600 concubines. Do you know what that concubine is? None of those concubines wanted to be there. There's another word for that that starts with a T that I can't say on YouTube. It has to do with carpooling. Why are you venerating him? Stop it. He was a Satanist. Venerating Solomon is just like venerating the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. Stop it. Stop it. It kept cropping up again and again like a, stud a sturdy vine that spreads underground and in surfaces. It appeared in places where the Inquisition and the establishment could not root it out. In the folk tales of Europe, its art, its literature, always hidden, 
often coded in symbols, but uh, uh, but ambiguous. It kept alive the hopes of the Davidic bloodline, which was often called the Vine. Nope, I disagree with you there, uh, Margaret Starbird. The, we do not want the David bloodline, honey. Listen, David was a raging Satanist. Solomon was David's son, the guy I just spoke about. David had a ton of sons with a ton of different women, many baby mamas. And the reason why he appointed his throne to Solomon, because out of all his baby mamas and all of his childrens, his children, David, or excuse me, Solomon was the only one that was doing human sacrifice. The rest of David's kids were like, yeah, no, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to hurt people, dad. Sorry. The rest of his children walked away from the satanic faith. Solomon stayed with the satanic faith. So we don't want the divinic bloodlines. The, the divinic bloodlines are the seed of Lucifer. Okay, that's not what Magdalene and Yeshua were. No, Yeshua was not from the house of Judah. He was Egyptian. He was from the Lyrans, which is the lion of the cosmos. You see how they do that? They mirror it because the darkness can't create anything and it, it can only take from the light and invert. So they mirrored it. They made the house of David, the house of Judah, the house of the lion on earth as their line when literally the Lyrans, Lyrans are galactic, which is what David, and which is what Yeshua and Magdalene were. They were the lions of the galactics, not of David. They were Egyptian. They were not Jewish. We have a lot. You know that Shakespeare quote, oh, the tangled webs we weave when first we practice to deceive. The controllers were very, very creative in their deception. And that is why when they took all these missing gospels, that they chucked them under the Vatican and made it punishable by death. Back then, after the Council of Nicaea, if you, which I don't think was as far away as we think it was, um, if you had the books of the Bible that were banned, you, you could be burned at the stake. So what were in those missing books of the Bible that were so important and so dangerous? Everything I'm telling you right now. Every fucking thing I'm telling you right now is what was in those missing books of the Bible that was so dated, like that totally countered everything they were trying to brainwash you and trick you. And, you know, I, I've heard it said before, and I think it's great. All these like deeply brainwashed Christians think that the Christian gospel spread so quickly because it was such good news and it was such a beautiful faith. No, it didn't. It spread so quickly because people were being boiled alive and burned at the stake and having their heads chopped off. People submitted in order to save themselves. The Christian faith has the most blood on its hand than any other religion in the world, including Satanism, traditional Satanism. Christianity is a form of Satanism. It is the most violent religion to ever exist on this planet. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't worship Jesus. I've talked to Yeshua. They're two different things. It gives me cre it, ma it makes my blood crawl when I hear the word Jesus because it means hell Satan. You're being played. If you're going to a church and you think you're worshiping the God of light, you're being played for a fool. Wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. If the church loses its grip on humanity, we're good. We're going to sail right into a new world. The church is the last grip of control the Satanists have on people. All right. There are several distinct possibilities regarding this heresy of Yahshua's marriage. Perhaps it was true and survived because its adherents not only believed but knew it to be true, perhaps through some proof such as framed treasures of the Templars in the form of authentic documents or artifacts, or perhaps it was primulated in an attempt to restore the lost feminine principle to the Christian dogma, which was clearly unbalanced in favor of the masculine. And as we say, yes, it was, they, they made it unbalanced. So why, why did the controllers destroy Magdalene and make her a prostitute and knock her away from Yahshua? Well, first of all, we know from the Magdalene manuscript and from the Gospels that Magdalene was the main teacher. She was the one that figured it out first. She initiated Yahshua. We know that they did not work independent of each other. They were, they were a teaching team, yin and yang. Okay, but it's not so much even about getting rid of the feminine. Well, I guess yes in some ways, but not in the way most people think. I, as we talked about with Return of the Divine Sophia, I personally do not believe we have been in a patriarchal society. I believe that we have been in a Luciferian society. You cannot have the patriarch 
without the matriarch. You cannot have the masculine without the feminine. The feminine is the intuitive arts. It's the intuitive side of humans. Even with even me as a woman, as a divine feminine, I also carry masculine energy too. Same as a man watching right now also carries feminine. Your intuition, your senses, those are feminine. So when we pull one away, very literally pull one away, it, it brings all of humanity into a place of, of imbalance. And what is another place? What does imbalance also mean? Disease. It brings us into a place of disease. So that is why they took away the feminine was not just to demand and demoralize women, but to make everyone sick. Okay. Energetically and spiritually sick. Because once something is sick and weak, it's easier to control. This restoration of the balance of opposites, the foundation of the classical philosophy must have been understood as necessary for the well-being of civilization. As I just said, the cult of the feminine flourished in province in the 12th century. Concurrent attempts of the Jewish Kabbalists to restore Lady Matronit as the lost consort of Yahweh in the Jewish mythology attest to the fact that such restoration of the feminine was considered important, indeed vital. Once again, a lot of people are under the misunderstanding. They think that Yahweh is God, because Yahweh is spoken about in the Old Testament, but you know, Yahweh is Moloch, a demonic god. Don't believe me? Do your research. Read the missing books of the Bible. A similar movement is afoot today in the Western world, tapping into Jungian studies in psychology, Asian understanding of yin yang, and goddess awareness. Also significant are the numerous recent apparitions of the Virgin Mary, Our Lady, Queen of Peace, the only goddess image allowed in Christianity, and her icons, which have been seen to shed tears in Christian churches north, uh, worldwide. Yeah, because they're like, fuck this. This shit is not what Yahshua taught. It's being manipulated by Lucifer. That's why they're crying. This phenomenon has been widely reported in the media in recent years. The church cannot claim that there is no message. Even the stones cry out. The scorned and forgotten feminine is big, begging to be acknowledged and embraced in our modern age. The loss of the feminine has had a disastrous impact on our culture. Both male and female are deeply wounded as the second millennia of Christianity draws to a close. The gifts of the feminine have not been fully accepted or appreciated. Meanwhile, the masculine, frustrated by an inability to channel its energies in harmony with a well-developed feminine, continues to lead with a sword arm, banishing weapons recklessly, often lashing out with violence and destruction. In the ancient world, the balance of opposite energies was understood and honored. But in our modern world, male attributes and attributes have dominated. It is a short step away from the worship of the power and glory of the male solar principle to sun worship, a cult that too often produces a spoiled and immature male, angry, frustrated, bored, and often dangerous. Eventually unable to integrate with its other half, the masculine suffers burnout. The end result of the devalued feminine, feminine principle is not just environmental pollution, hedonism, and rantic crime, but ultimate end is Holocaust. This book is an exploration of the heresy of the Holy Grail and an argument for the restoration of the wife of Yahshua based on important circumstantial evidence. It is also a quest for the meaning of the lost bride in the human psyche and the hope that her return to our paradigm for wholeness will help to heal the wasteland. In this book, I have recorded the results of my personal search for the lost bride in the Christian story. I have tried to explain how she came to be lost and how devastating that loss has been for the Western civilization. And I have tried to envision what would happen if the bride were be to, to be restored to the paradigm. The years I have spent researching this material have taken their toll. I did not take this story lightly. I have struggled with the material in this book, wrestling with it to give it form and substance. The labor was both long and difficult. At times, I feared it would turn me inside out. Doctrines I had believed on faith had to be uprooted and discarded, and new beliefs had to be sown and allotted to take root. The entire Roman Catholic framework of my childhood had to be dismantled to uncover the dangerous fault and the foundation, and then the belief system carefully rebuilt when the fissure had been sealed. This process has taken seven years. At some point, I gave up on being an ap apologist for the doctrine and embarked on a quest for the truth. I, I am excruciating aware that my conclusions are not orthodox, but that does me not mean they are untrue. Orthodox just means mind control, right? Many people are becoming increasingly aware of the chasm between the discoveries of the modern 
of modern Bible scholars and the versions Christianity taught from the pulpits of churches. I hope this book will serve as a bridge that spans this gap. While I was a student at Vanderbilt Divinity School in Nashville, Tennessee in 1988 and 1989, I discovered that many illuminating books written by scripture scholars lie fallow, fallow on library shelves for decades without ever being read or noted, partly because of the dryness of their style and dictation. For this reason, I decided to write in the vernacular. I have included footnotes when necessary, but basically I have told the story in a form that can be easily received and digested. A friend told, once told me that instead of grinding my offering of gain, grain and baking it, I tend to dump it into the bushels in the people's laps. In this book, I have attempted to both to grind the grain and to bake it into a nourishing loaf. In writing this book, I have taken the liberty of comparing passages in several Bibles and choosing the wording that best expressed the meanings I was trying to convey. The Bible I have used for years and from which the majority of my quotations are taken is the St. Joseph New Catholic Edition written in 1963, only because it is the Bible with which I am the most familiar. In several cases, text, text chosen from the New International Version, the NIV of 1978, and so is identified. It doesn't really matter because they're both offshoots of the King James Bible, which the King James Bible is a complete load of shit. It was made up. King, King James made most of it up himself with the help of the Freemasons. The real Bible at that time was called the Geneva Bible, and that was destroyed. It, King James made sure it was destroyed. I've tried to be consistent in using the names and numbering for the books and Psalms found in the Protestant canon of the Bible because these are the most widely recognized. It is my hope that this book will inspire others to begin their own personal quest for the most precious treasure of Christianity, a pearl of great price, the Holy Grail.